Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us in this uh, session about the IO Twins project. Uh, let me share my screen so that uh, you can, uh, here we go. You can see the presentation. Okay, today we talk uh, about the IO Twins, pro IO Twins project, uh, which is an Horizon 2020 founded project. Uh, involving uh, several high-level partners. We talk about this point later on. The title of the project is uh, Distributed Digital Twins for Industrial SMEs, a big data platform. And uh, the name IO Twins actually is the merge between Digital Twins, which is already in the title, and IoT services, because you will see this platform is providing uh, several services. And among these, uh, there are uh, a, IoT services and digital twin uh, solutions. Okay, uh, my name is Francesco Mirlo. I'm a manager in Bonfiglioli. Bonfiglioli is uh, a, an Italian manufacturing company. And I, am, uh, I have the honor to be the project coordinator here for this project. Today, uh, the discussion will be about uh, the project overall, and uh, my presentation is actually about the project overall. And then, okay, you see here the agenda. And then uh, we will have Andrea Borghese from uh, University of Bologna uh, talking about the platform and the services provided by the platform. Then we will have two business cases. Uh, one of them uh, will be presented by Bassem Hikri, and the second one by, by Fernando Cucchetti. Okay, this project is uh, an innovation action. Uh, and uh, actually it's a pretty relevant one because uh, the total cost uh, is roughly 20 million euro and the European uh, Commission is providing 60 million out of the 20, uh, of, of the overall uh, cost of 20 million. And uh, as many of these projects, uh, the overall uh, duration of this project is three years. Uh, you see the deadline is August 22. So we spent uh, more than two years working on this project. Okay. The idea here uh, is to let you understand what is the basic structure of the project and the ultimate goal. The idea of the European Commission, when uh, they made this kind of uh, project, when they proposed uh, this kind of project, was to have a platform available for small medium enterprises in order to lower barriers for uh, small businesses to have uh, to reach uh, the new industry 4.0 technologies uh, that allow process optimization and uh, productivity growth uh, in all our companies. So here we are contributing to this goal, developing a platform that should be available in the future also for other business, not just for the one involved in this, uh, in this consortium. And to do that, uh, we prepared 12 uh, large scale test beds uh, uh, belonging to three, three areas uh, that are manufacturing, facility management, and replicability. I think that the most relevant part, the most uh, relevant feature of this consortium is the are the members of this consortium. Here you see, these are the members. The members are uh, 23, coming from eight different uh, European countries. Um, okay, here there are no, there are hugely famous names such as Siemens, Fraunhofer, Thales, uh, uh, and so on. But uh, let me say that uh, here a very important law, uh, role is played by Cineca and Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Fernando is one of the speakers today because uh, these are two of the three supercomputing centers in Europe. The third one is in uh, Finland. And then you can easily understand that our application was stronger than uh, those of uh, other consortiums that were competing against us, thanks to the presence of these two very important, very important uh, players. Okay. Uh, you can, uh, 
also see that there is a famous uh, sportive club uh, here in this uh, consortium that is the Barcelona Football Club. I will not spoil <laughs> the content of, the, of this test bed because uh, it will be addressed later on. Uh, let me just tell you that this is an important, uh, I think, message when also a sport club like Barcelona has a spin-off uh, that is the Barcelona Innovation Hub uh, dedicated to innovation. So innovation is so important today that uh, even uh, sport club uh, have spin-offs dedicated to this kind of uh, goal. Okay. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, Bonfioli is a coordinator. I have uh, the pleasure to be the one actually. And University of Bologna is the scientific coordinator. So we rely a lot on their competencies. And here we have today uh, Andrea Borghese from University of Bologna. Uh, we rely on their competence uh, to have uh, the scientific part uh, well managed. At the same time, time we have also Be Warrant, uh, which is uh, a consulting company, we say project management company, we say uh, that actually is involved in several European projects and is uh, giving uh, their support to this consortium uh, to have the overall results. Uh, the other companies will be, maybe I will talk a little bit about them later on during uh, the presentation. Uh, Okay, here is the structure. The structure is the following. We have a technological platform that is built at the beginning from those members that have uh, competences in this kind of solutions. So, University of Bologna, Fraunhofer, Thales, Cineca, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, is, uh, the Italian uh, Institute of Nuclear Physics. Uh, so they are building this platform in order to provide services that are mainly uh, IoT, as I said, services, edge computing services, machine learning, big data services, artificial inter, uh, intelligence services, and digital twins, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning. So all these uh, services uh, go to support uh, the implementation of our 12 test beds, of our 12 pilots. Our pilots are split into two areas, so we have manufacturing test beds. For example, we as Bonfiglioli, we are leader in the production of gearboxes for wind turbines. And so together with KK Wind Solution, we are um, testing uh, our capability to provide uh, predictive maintenance services to end users. And uh, then we have also two more test beds. One of them uh, uh, is led by Guala Closure, so I don't, I don't want to spoil uh, again uh, the testbed because Bassem will talk about this later on. And then we have facility management testbeds. So in this case, we have the application of this kind of services to facility management situation to improve um, productivity, efficiency, and management basically of this kind of uh, of situation. And then we come to the replicability testbeds. And here I think uh, we have. Uh, maybe one specific feature of this project, because as I said at the beginning, the goal of the European Commission on this project is to build up a platform and make it available also to other, to, other, to other businesses, to other companies. So after our projects, the goal is that our platform can be available and suitable for small medium enterprises of our businesses and also of other businesses in order to improve their productivity, their optimization process, uh, their process optimization and so on. So these fire replicability pilots are pilots where we test if the solution we already experimented successfully in the same initial pilots is also um, reliable and uh, available for other similar but different solutions. Okay, and this will be a really killer point of our, um, of our project. Okay, uh, here there are more details about um, the test beds, uh, you see uh, the 12 test beds. So uh, you can easily see that in uh, the manufacturing test beds, the key point is about the pretty maintenance and process improvement. Okay, 
while in uh, the uh, facility management, uh, the key goal is improving uh, uh, the management of this kind uh, of, of the facility. Uh, also, in, you see this one, the number seven is the management of a wide scale smart grid uh, in a living lab. But this is uh, made uh, thanks to the effort of Siemens. Uh, you can easily understand how this is uh, somehow very important for the future management of facility of facilities. Okay, um, now moving on uh, in uh, the other three uh, work packages, uh, there are the typical project management uh, work package, the one about exploitation and the one about outreach activities. Now, uh, <clears throat> my time uh, is almost expiring, so my, I often uh, check my watch to see if I'm out of time. And uh, I think it is very important now that you got the overall picture. This is the overall picture of the project. Then we have also some other, um, here you see some other detail, but I wouldn't invest uh, my time on this. I would just uh, need you to remember this kind of structure and to know that after, um, our uh, one hour meeting, um, we will uh, be available also in, uh, in the following session uh, for uh, questions or for discussion uh, if needed. In other words, uh, there will be a virtual booth after this uh, uh, presentation and we will be able, uh, we will be there to, for a Q and A session. Let me put it in this way. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Now, as uh, anticipated before, I will leave the stage uh, to Andrea Borghesi from University of Bologna that we talk uh, about uh, platform and services. Thank you very much. Andrea, you are mute. Yeah, thank you, Francesco. Thank you for your nice introduction. So I guess I will start sharing my screen right now. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Borghesi, and I'm a researcher at the University of Bologna. And uh, within our group, we have been working a lot on this IoTMS project uh, in terms of uh, uh, providing infrastructural capability, in terms of uh, uh, defining uh, actually how the platform should have been uh, uh, constructed and how the platform should be integrated and how all the data coming from the different test beds should be integrated within the platform. And finally, on top of this, we also worked on developing and deploying uh, the services that will help the construction of the actual digital twins. And specifically, we are uh, working on these services from the perspective of AI, so artificial intelligence, because the idea is that, that due to the fact that uh, with modern uh, monitoring infrastructure is possible to collect uh, a huge amount of data coming from industrial test bed and the variety of partners which compose the IoTMS consortium with all this data, which is uh, a value in itself, we are capable of actually create the digital twin. We, have, we are capable of uh, uh, building a, a variety of different models which actually encapsulates the, mod, uh, the system behavior. And this is basically the idea behind, uh, behind the project, as Francesco was saying. The idea was then to build uh, these, uh, let's say, digital twins as a series of uh, services which are uh, has been highlighted, which were identified in, after a let's say uh, collection of requirements from the different partners to better uh, adapt the services to their needs, and then we build this series of services in order to meet to, uh, to have them as reusable and composable as possible. And broadly speaking, we identified three main areas of. Uh, of uh, of intervention of different kind of models that were very useful for the project and for the creation of digital twins, machine learning and deep learning model, for example, uh, fault prediction and uh, uh, remaining useful life prediction, uh, simulation models, uh, uh, optimization models such as uh, parameter tuning and so on. And these are the three main classes of services that were developed and deployed on the IoTwins platform. The main idea, which I want you to actually uh, go away from this talk and remember, the main idea of IoTwins is to 
bridge the gap between the artificial intelligence ex experts and the small medium enterprise and facility manager because we are um, targeting both small and medium enterprises and uh, larger scale uh, plants and larger scale system and the idea is that uh, the, the knowledge uh, involved in creating uh, artificial intelligence artificial intelligence models is not uh, so widespread yet so the idea was to create these services to bridge as much as possible this gap. And these services were uh, identified uh, through a collection of requirements from the 12 different aspects. So after plenty of meeting with the industrial partners to best their assess their need. And finally, they were developed and they are still under the currently under deployment and integration in the IoT News platform. The idea to better, let's say, address the variety of the needs by the partner were to start by developing a series of general services, which were, let's say, reusable and that were easy to uh, um, adapt and to tailor to the specific needs of the different, uh, of each own different aspect. The idea was then to create an uh, overall platform uh, which can run both on edge devices and on IoT devices and on the cloud infrastructure provided by uh, INFN, uh, Super Barcelona Supercomputing Center and, uh, and the Cineca Supercomputing Center here in Italy. So these services can run both on the edge and on the cloud. On the IoT, on the IoT devices, the, the IoT devices are mostly used to uh, collect data because uh, uh, the artificial intelligence based services, they do require a, a minimum of uh, computational power, computational capability. So we realized that uh, the best idea was to run and deploy the services only on the edge and on the cloud. Whereas the data collection is in part, which is uh, much more lightweight, takes place on the IoT, on the IoT layer. And uh, to offer an easy way to uh, schedule these services, to interact with this service, run these services, we decided to deploy them as uh, containers, basically runnable on Docker. So we abstracted all the uh, complexity behind the actual code of the service, behind the actual uh, libraries and components, software components that need to be installed to run everything correctly and so on. So in this way, these services are very, very reusable. We don't have time in this, uh, in this presentation, but I, uh, I put here in the slide uh, a link to a YouTube uh, collection of videos where we show how the services have been actually used and uh, on the, uh, by, by the different aspects. And so it's a, a nice reminder on, to see how the services can be used. And they were developed using both uh, open source uh, uh, software, uh, open source solution and uh, proprietary software. So the idea is that we have created also a, a repository which will contain partial proprietary stuff, which is not going to be published, is not going to be uh, ex exported as open source, but part of the services are going to be uh, made open source and uh, distributed, published at the end of the project. This is a, an ongoing effort that we are still working on. We are finalizing of the, on the documentation and on the creation of the actual stuff. But uh, what is important, in my opinion, uh, in, this, uh, in this project, the data is very important. So uh, the first part of the project, basically the first, uh, the first year, was devoted to understanding which data uh, could be used, which data was available, and how to collect this data from all the different partners. And mainly, we had two um, macro area of a type of data, historical data, which is available on batches, and this is typically stored on cloud system, and data streams that come from IoT devices and on the edge possibly the edge do some pre-processing, some, some processing and some partial computation, but mostly the data comes from IoT device. And the key, the key, the key aspect here is that uh, the data is extremely, extremely heterogeneous. We are dealing with a uh, huge difference inside in terms of uh, industrial partners and scales and so on. So we have data from industrial machinery, from wind turbines, from, uh, from the stadium, large scale data system, data centers, so plenty of data. But uh, this plenty of data, was usually um, available in large quantity. So that's why deep learning models were uh, a good, uh, uh, let's say, a nice test case for using deep learning models in a real scenario. And that's basically what we've done. The idea was that we identified what was the most, uh, let's say, uh, used and the most uh, required needs from the different partners. And uh, one thing that uh, 
come up a lot of the time was the capability to detect and to realize when a component is uh, going to break. For example, uh, if I have a, a wind turbine, I want to know, uh, looking at the vibration of uh, that the, my wind turbine generates on my, on my engine and my retractor, I want to know if the component is going to break, that the same stuff is, can be done also in a large scale system and so on. And, so, and then we hi highlighted a lot, we, we developed uh, at least, uh, let's say, 60% of the models that we have devo are devoted to identify the, when a component is going to break. So they are devoted to the so-called predictive maintenance stuff, which is a key element for, for Industry 4.0. And now, after this brief, let's say, overall view, I wanted to give you a more, let's say, in-depth uh, example of one of the services. This is just one of the services that we have developed. We have now uh, between uh, 20 and uh, 25 services. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a running, uh, a running, a running list of services, so we haven't uh, yet uh, completed the development of all of them. We are working on services also for uh, data visualization. We are working on service for moving data from the IoT and the edge and back. We are moving, we are creating services to move the deep learning models from the cloud where they are typically trained and high performance computing capability because in case you don't know, training deep learning models tends to be very computationally expensive. So we train the models on the cloud and on the uh, on the high, high performance computing capability. And then we move back these models on the edge to perform live, for example, anomaly detection, live prediction on the stream of data. And now I want to give you a more, let's say, uh, overall view of one specific test case, uh, which was uh, uh, one of the first we started working. This is particular the test case number, number six and uh, is uh, devoted to the area of uh, data center monitoring. So. Uh, we have here in Bologna a uh, data center which is uh, hosted technically in Cineca, so uh, one of the largest supercomputing center uh, in Italy and, and in Europe. And uh, in a data center, you have uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of components. Uh, you have, uh, I mean, in uh, in the last uh, and most powerful supercomputer, Marconi M100, we have. Uh, almost 1000 computing nodes but each node is composed by hundreds of components so we have a lot of data coming from all these nodes all these data sources which are extremely heterogeneous very complicated stuff very very hard for a system administrator to make any sense of this huge amount of data that comes into that comes in from the collection measurement system every uh, microsecond, every second, every 10 seconds, every minute, it strongly depends on the data. So what we have done here, we decided to create a digital twin of this infrastructure, of this Marconi 100 supercomputing system. And we developed a series of tools for doing that. So first, we started by, we started from the ground, we started from the bare metal and we uh, installed uh, on the bare metal, a series of uh, monitoring components, uh, which we called Examon in, uh, in the, the overall data monitoring system. And we collect data from a variety of sources, from physical sensor to uh, job scheduler and so on. And the idea is that then we can use this model, uh, sorry, we can use this data to build a machine learning model, in particular, a deep learning model. We, we use a, an autoencoder, to be completely honest. We do it, technical detail, not important. But once we train the deep learning model used in the uh, long-term storage data that we have collected in uh, one year and a half of uh, continuous monitoring, we have now have a, 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 we have a tool that can be used to perform live uh, online inference on the real data. And with this real data, Data, we can automatically realize when a component of the computing nodes is, a, is behaving in a proper way or in an abnormal way. And this is very important because this, this is what is called anomaly detection. And you see here, for example, this is, an out, this is the outcome of one of these models. The blue line tells us when uh, it's, it's a metric that's called the reconstruction error. When the reconstruction error, this blue line, is below the yellow line, that means that everything is fine. When the yellow line, the, when the blue line is 
above the yellow line, the yellow dashed line, that means that our system, our detection model thinks that something is wrong. And mm, the good things here is that uh, you see the red highlighted area here and the blue highlighted area correspond to actual anomalies on the mm, computing system. And so we know that when we are in this light blue area here, our system is, our, our deep learning model is identifying that some problem is going on. And this um, identification corresponds exactly with an accuracy between 90 and 95% to the real periods of time where we had an anomaly. So we are very, very happy with that. I mean, this is actually demonstrating that this kind of tools, and uh, which is a deep neural network uh, called an autoencoder trained to recognize the normal behavior of the supercomputing nodes uh, in a uh, data center, in a large scale data center, is actually capable to distinguish uh, when used, when deployed as services in the IoT platform, is capable to distinguish between normal behavior and anormal behavior. One can ask, is this useful? The question, the answer is yes, this is very useful because system administrators typically spend a lot of their time to identify the uh, nodes not working properly. So having an automated way to do this is very, very time, time, time saving and cost saving because downtime in a computing center is very, very expensive. Furthermore, uh, what we realize is that if you also add some information about uh, uh, so-called labels, so if we also provide the information better characterizing uh, when and how the system was failing and we feed this data to our autoencoder model, we can then also realize that something is off, that there is a problem with the uh, hardware node, with the supercomputing nodes, even before the anomaly arises. So we can also predict the anomaly. And this is very, very good, to me, in, my, in my opinion, and in, in the opinion of everyone involved in this project. And you see here, the blue line corresponds to an anomalous period, and the yellow line here corresponds to uh, the output of our prediction model. When the yellow line starts uh, getting a bit angsty, starts to be a bit, uh, you know, uh, going up and down, this means that the, the, uh, the deep learning model is actually capable of predicting in advance the arisal of an anomaly in the next uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. On average, we can predict the, in, the insurgency of a fault, of a faulty condition, with an average of uh, one hour, between 40 minutes and one hour before the actual insurgency of anomaly. And if you can ask me, this is extremely important because not only we are capable of doing the so-called, uh, let's say, Predictive, main, uh, predictive maintenance, but if we know in advance that something is going on which is bad, we can schedule an intervention, we can change a component which is going to break, and we can do it with a very, uh, now with an advance of one hour, which is already enough to schedule the workload on different nodes, for example, in a supercomputing center. But in the future, we plan also to expand this on uh, with further, let's say, time periods, with longer time periods. And uh, I think that uh, it's everything that I wanted to show. So thank you for, for your attention, uh, everyone. And now I will uh, let the stage to the following speaker. Thank you again. Thank you, Andrea. So I think it's my turn now to, uh, to start the presentation. So hello, everybody. Uh, this is Bassem Hishi from uh, GCL International, uh, which is part uh, of Guala Closure Group. And uh, it's, in fact, a market leader in the production of aluminum and uh, non-refillable closures. Hello. <coughs> Okay, so my presentation today will be structured as follow. I will uh, do an introduction about the test bed related to our iTwins project. And uh, sorry, Bassem, sorry, we, we see your presentation in working mode. If you can put it, uh, if you go back to the slideshow mode. Yes, now it works. Oh, I don't know, but there is. Okay, good. I did. Okay, perfect. 
<coughs> okay, uh, so uh, hello again, this is Bas Mihishi from GCL uh, International, which is the Research and Development Center of Koala Closure Group. And the Koala Closure Group is a uh, market leader in the production of aluminum and uh, non-refillable closures. So today my presentation uh, will focus on the testbed developed within the IU Twins project related to uh, predictive maintenance and production optimization for uh, closure manufacturing. And uh, it will be structured as follows. So I will uh, make a present an introduction about the testbed and its structures and the different performed activities and results uh, for the testbed considered by uh, GCN. <coughs> So our goal in um, for this testbed is to aggregate big data uh, from a selected machine from the production uh, sites of uh, Guala Closure Group and to reduce the loss of productivity due to downtime because uh, it has an economic impact explained by expensive repairing costs. Also, we would like to foresee the breakage um, of high frequency failing components as observed by um, previous experienced people, and also to improve the overall efficient equipment efficiency as uh, explained in the figure shown here. So, um, and uh, uh, for our use case, uh, we target the injection molding machine. So the injection molding machine, as most of the people knows, it's uh, mainly a machine for plastic uh, products uh, manufacturing. And it's composed mainly uh, of two parts, the injection unit and the clamping unit. So um, uh, based on this use case and uh, this testbed, we identify the relevant process information and mainly uh, the process information, it's the injection time cycle. And, um, and also we target to add uh, um, additional external sensors to the machine in order to predict the injection bearing mal mal malfunctions. <laughs> so in this uh, testbed, we target to uh, integrate data collection from various machinery and processes uh, in the plant. We also uh, aim it to develop a digital twin simulation environment and data analytics, and uh, to test reliability and expandability of data collection and uh, data analytics. So in terms of performed activities and results, so for this uh, use case, uh, we use the uh, factory sensors already embedded in, um, in the machine. As you can see, the video shows already the uh, different sensors that we integrate. These are additional ones, but uh, first we use the already integrated sensor of, uh, of the machine, such as the cycle counter, press cycle, heating, status, pressure, injection parameter, rotation speeds. And we added additional external sensors like uh, uh, modules for power consumption, which includes current voltage, total active power, uh, active energy, apparent power and energy. And also the main component that we target to predict uh, its failure and to do predictive maintenance, it's for the bearing, the injection bearing. And for that, we included additional sensors that already uh, can measure the vibration speed, the vibration acceleration, and the temperature. And um, we had the bearing status, uh, which was defined based on uh, um, norm ISO 10816 about the behavior of the bearings to normal, abnormal warning or pre-warning. And these, um, these status were already uh, defined by uh, these norms. The data sample, uh, sample is uh, done every 500 mi uh, milliseconds. So here in this slide, I showed just uh, a sample of data about uh, the uh, different uh, measurements that we are doing uh, based on the additional sensors related to uh, the um, velocity and acceleration of the bearings and the vibration and the, the temperature. And as you can see, the alarm arises when uh, um, uh, the level of uh, vibration exceeds a certain value or threshold defined by the norm that I already uh, explained in the previous slide. <coughs> Here uh, I present a video about the um, digital twin environment and simulation environment that was developed by uh, uh, our IT uh, team for the uh, connection of the different uh, machinery of the plant. 
and then we'll just uh, jump directly here to show uh, how we do the um, real-time monitoring of the different machinery of uh, the plants and uh, how we are able to collect the data in real time in order to use it uh, to uh, predict the failure of the different machines. Here, just I show uh, this example for the injection bonding machine, where you can see the different parameters that we extract in real time in order to monitor the, the systems. And as soon as uh, an anomaly appears, then uh, we have the alarm. Uh, and uh, as we said, so based on the iTwins results and the uh, prediction model, we uh, we are able to predict the failure of the machine uh, around one hour before it happens, which allows uh, to uh, predict uh, uh, and uh, to ensure predictive maintenance. <clears throat> uh, about the architecture of the uh, of uh, of the system, so as you can see here, we have the uh, injection molding machine uh, in which we uh, added several PLC modules for energy consumption, the uh, additional modules, as I said, uh, in addition to the external sensors and the, by using a middleware software, which defines the protocols of communication with the different sensors, we can uh, get the different data from the machine. We have a reporting tool that allows to pull the data from the machine and then to store it in the database that can be consulted internally to the uh, by the company and at the same time sent to the uh, cloud and uh, in order to uh, uh, to to use the uh, different uh, model uh, machine learning models that are developed by uh, university of bologna and the different partners of the project <clears throat> so um in fact about the machine learning model proposed as it was explained by uh, andrea in the previous presentation so it's remaining useful life estimation model that has been developed by University of Bologna, and it predicts the malfunction or breakdown of machine components. It's using the recurrent neural network of time series, and um, uh, it has supervised learning on time series data uh, with multi-class level bearing status, as I said, which were uh, defined by the norm of manufacturers of the bearing to normal alarming warning and pre-warning. So depending on uh, thresholds that are defined by the constructors of, um, of uh, these components, uh, the models are trained, validated, and tested on real-world data gathered over uh, two months of production. And uh, as you can see, in fact, <clears throat> the abnormal behavior of the machine along three months, it occurred only 5% of the running time of the machine, which makes the problem very challenging to develop a, re a reliable a prediction uh, model. Uh, so the model, it gives the probability of survival uh, P, its value indicating whether the machine will operate currently uh, correctly in the next hour or a failure may occur. So depending on the value of P, uh, the, the model can um, define and provide uh, the possibility of the failure of the machine. So here, for example, based on uh, data collected from the machine, for a given day in which the machine had uh, one critical alarm at around uh, 2.15, two hours before the alarm, the model predicts that no failure will occur. As you can see in the graph, the uh, red dots, it presents the status of uh, the machine, and the uh, blue dots, it uh, presents the prediction. So, and as we said, that the model uh, allows the prediction one hour before, so at uh, three, uh, 1 30, one hour before the alarm, the survival probability, as you can see, drops uh, from approximately 1 to 0 0.85. And the probability drops further, reaching a minimum of 0 0.1 at 2.15. This corresponds to the moment in which the alarm occurs. And um, after the alarm occurs at 2.30, the status of the machine returns to normal operating conditions and the survival probability value returns to be approximately one once the machine failure is solved. So here it was the validation of the model and the testing based on the data acquired uh, from the machine and uh, based on concrete and real conditions. Here it's uh, just a video simulating the model based on the data. And as you can see uh, what uh, I explained before. So. So this test bed, it's, um, it was uh, one of the test beds to validate uh, the different models developed by the, uh, the partners of the project. 
So as FutureWorks, uh, we try to, uh, we aim to improve the training data quality, analyze correlation between the process parameters, uh, discover additional connections between machine status and other variables. We also would like to add more sensors to the machine to improve process status monitoring. Uh, in terms of model accuracy and uh, robustness, we uh, try to, um, to increase the prediction from one hour to uh, two, four, or eight hours before the failure occurs. So we try to make the model more efficient and more um, reliable and uh, uh, better to predict uh, the failure um, as soon as possible in order to ensure the uh, maintenance. And uh, in terms of, uh, <clears throat> uh, we would like also to integrate uh, in uh, our platforms of the company. We would like to um, extend this test bed. We tried to make the test for the first test bed for in one machine. Actually, we are replicating in different machines. And the idea is to, um, to spread and to uh, replicate for the, um, all the machinery of, uh, of the group. So thank you so much. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, normally we can meet on the booth after the session. Thank you so much. So I think, Fernando, uh, you have uh, the word to... Uh... Thank, you. Thank you, yes. Okay. So, hello, everyone. And um, thank you to thank you for being here. So I'm going to talk about uh, another version of another part of the project. So we have been we have been uh, talking about the uh, manufacturing digital twins, and we have a, a different section of the IO twins project devoted to facility management. And in particular, the test bed that we'll talk about is the Football Club Barcelona Camp Nou Stadium test bed. So this uh, digital twin or problem lies more in the uh, so, uh, in the smart venues type of uh, problem. So when we talk of facility management, we can be talking about many other things like energy or a factory. So we're here we're talking about uh, something slightly different because we have a lot of people. So if we're talking about a, a, a factory, we would have sensorized machines and we would be worried about algorithms for efficient operations of the machines or of optimizing energy consumption, predictive maintenance, what we just uh, saw. In the area of smart venues, uh, what we have is sensorized people. So what we have, we, we also have a facility. In this case, the stadium has uh, a lot of new technology uh, that is also part of the smart venue uh, uh, definition, which is responsive camera control, facility sensors, high connectivity, and uh, sustainability with active uh, and, and passive uh, uh, components. However, we are uh, interested in managing the people that go to the stadium, and for this. We want to have algorithms that help us improve the experience of the fans that attend the stadium, uh, algorithms that help us reinforce safety and security in the stadium. And these algorithms will have uh, a lot to do with something that doesn't happen in industrial machinery, which is the free will of people, apart from the randomness that we could have from the weather and other types of uh, elements that we, we will discuss. So in this, um, in this digital twin, the structure what we have is here. I will go through this in more detail, but basically we have the stadium, which, which has a lot of IoT devices. And we focus mostly on the Wi-Fi um, connectivity that allows us to, to sense where people are located. The turnstiles that give us information of when people are coming in and out of the stadium. Some cameras that help us uh, fine tune and, and get a little bit more details in some other um, Parts of the stadium, and then uh, ticketing, vending, smart IoT information that you know comp complement and give us context about what people are doing. All of this is processed by some of the edge nodes, and, and is mixed with external data that helps us pre-analyze the data and transmit the statistics to the cloud. And this is very important here because the system is designed to preserve an anonymity and privacy of people. So nothing is ever stored. Nothing, nothing, no information. Um, related to the people's personal identifiable information is ever stored or sent to the cloud. It's always uh, just processed and deleted immediately in the edge nodes. And then statistics uh, and data are already anonymized is sent through the edge nodes to the cloud and goes to the third step where we have some AI models that help us uh, um, profile and understand the audience. 
that is uh, in, in the stadium, especially things that affect mobility, such as age and gender or the provenance. Then this uh, information is used in the actual digital doing the simulation, which is an agent-based model. And here we optimize uh, situations like evacuation or entry or exit of people. Imagine that we have um, 100,000 people almost coming in and out of the stadium in a normal match. It's one of the largest stadiums in, in, in Europe. So this is a pretty um, uh, large problem. And for this, we, uh, we have to do a lot of simulations and this, this requires supercomputers. And finally, these optimal configurations in, are sent to the edge nodes to actuate. These edge nodes can be digital signage or can be just uh, phones from the logistics crew, helping them go to see a problem or attend or maybe just prevent a situation before it happens. So let's uh, talk about a little bit more about these components in detail. So sensors and edge devices are quite simple actually. So we have uh, turnstiles like the ones in the photo, and then we have access points that track people in, in, the, in the whereabouts of the stadium. So on the right, you see a map where we have some, uh, I'm showing just a little, little bit of the stadium, showing some access points, and we have uh, about 1,800 of them in the stadium. And this provides us with a lot of data, right? We have to analyze and process that quite a bit because it's quite noisy and not super clean. What is uh, actually quite clean is, is the data from the, uh, turnstiles, it gives us a lot of information about the entrance of people. So what you see there on the lower uh, left is the number of entries to the stadium before a game. So marked mark at uh, minute zero. And the uh, black line is the average, but you see there's a lot of variation coming from the uh, from the uh, from this data. Then this depends on a lot of, of, of components. Now I will talk about that in a moment. So all of this data is uh, aggregated, like I said, complemented with some extra information and then sent to the machine uh, learning components in the cloud. And here, what, what is the type of things that we analyze? So we have data coming, this is static data from like the maps, for instance, and these are on the right of the screen. And we have some data that has been collected before the project and also before the, the matches that allows us to give a, get an idea of where people are coming. So we get data from social media, for instance, where um, we, we can figure out more or less what, what people have done before this, coming to the stadium. If, if they uh, went to a restaurant or see another, uh, or maybe see another uh, touristic spot in Barcelona. We have also information from mobility in the city that allows us to get uh, an idea of where, uh, uh, how many how many people we have on their profiles in terms of age and, and gender and for instance we can get uh, what you see on the right here are typical distributions of people in the city in barcelona as uh, with respect to age and, and gender and um, location if they're local or tourists and what you see on the little vertical lines are the uh, specific location for the Camp Nou stadium so this is what we know that is typically the composition of people in a match day in, in the time range where we have a, a, a match. And what you see on the left is what we get from social uh, media data uh, of check-ins, for instance, of what, what people do before and after coming to the stadium. So we have a little box in there in the blue. It's a, quite a complex graph. Uh, in blue, we have the stadium. And what all the arrows are people that uh, did something else in the stadium that maybe come directly from the rest, from the airport or maybe they stopped at the, at the restaurant or, or maybe at the Sagrada Familia. And this gives us an idea of what people will do uh, when, when they get to the stadium and, and further, to, further tune our models. Then we also have an idea of where they come from, if they come directly from the uh, metropolitan area of Barcelona. And depending on the hour, hour, hour of the day and day of the week, the composition changes. And then we have also uh, information on whether they come from different countries. And, and if the countries are nearby, you know, like France, or, and they can, and they probably came by car, and they can do some stuff before, or they come from uh, other places in the world. All of this information is gathered and allows us to do predictions like these ones in, in this uh, slide. We have what we call the attendance influx. We can model and predict the amount of people that will uh, enter the stadium by gate and by minute, including their profile. And here I'm showing an example of how we can distinguish between locals uh, which are usually club members and they come every week to the stadium to see a match and tourists that bought a ticket a few days or a few weeks before and they come to the stadium as part of their, their visit to the city so what you see on the uh, top left uh, chart there 
this is uh, account data. So for many matches, we see that the tourists and the members of, of the club members behave very differently. So tourists uh, tend to arrive. So this is the minutes related to the game in the x-axis and the amount of people that come to the stadium, in, enter the stadium uh, is in the y-axis. In blue, you see the tourists. And you see that they can, uh, they usually come to the stadium like an hour and a half or maybe two hours before. They probably walk around, take pictures, and, and they do some stuff like visiting the grounds. And club members tend to arrive mostly just before the start of the game. So they, they might uh, get some problems into the logistics of, of people coming. So these models that we, uh, we use this data to train these mo models that will predict what will happen uh, when we have a, a match. Like on the right, you, see, you can see uh, the same matches where we can predict what would happen if it rains. So what happens when it rains is that uh, locals tend to rush a little bit more. So they tend to come a little bit um, later, just, be just before the game starts. And tourists actually is, uh, try to arrive even earlier than before. So maybe they, they see that the, the day is going to be complicated for taking pictures and then they just... Uh, this is the opportunity to just go there and make sure that they have time to do everything. And this model allows us to, like I said, to predict gate by gate and minute by minute what is going to, to happen and allows us to do a lot of logistics. So we can take a game, an existing game or one in the future, and we can predict what's going to happen with this game in terms of the people coming to the stadium. So what you see on the lower right of, of the screen uh, is the same match everything the same, so the same opponent, which uh, affects a lot, the same day of the week, the same <clears throat> uh, rain or, or weather conditions. And what we change is the uh, competition where this match is held, either La Liga or Champions League in the middle or Copa del Rey. And what, what you see there is that the behavior of people coming to these matches is very different. But we see a lot of uh, different components and we have many features that affect the entrances of the, of the uh, visitors to the stadium. And we use these models, like I said, to predict, to predict and inform what is the digital twin. This digital twin runs in our supercomputer in Marinostrum, and it's uh, high, it needs to this high performance element, which it's uh, the, this is the picture of Marinostrum on the top right. It's uh, this uh, Spanish national supercomputing facility. It's one of the largest computers in Europe. And the current version number four is going to be replaced next year by number five uh, to put it on top uh, on par with uh, the Helsinki and Chineca. Yeah, supercomputers. And what we use there is our software called Pandora to do agent-based simulations. So we simulate where people will go. We input all of the information that we know about their profiles and their interests and the plan uh, of the stadium that helps us uh, know where the points of interest are. And we need the supercomputer because we have to uh, simulate many times. So we have to create uh, lots and lots of simulations to take into account what people will do, which is a, a little bit of random decisions here and there. And these decisions are in, included into what we, what we have is the a pedestrian modeling. So we know what people will do. We put some uh, typical behavior that we, they will avoid uh, collide with, with objects. They, we have their uh, profile, basically inform us of what they will do, what, if they were going to take pictures or go directly to the seat, or maybe they, get, they will get lost or, or go to the bathroom every now and then. And we have some information uh, for, on, on what, how they will find all of these uh, in these uh, locations, if they will know exactly where it is, or the, if they will need to read the signs and so on. So with this, we create the simulations, and we create the output for the model. And I'm going to put this video now for uh, for you to play. So this is um, a video showing you the entrance to the stadium, and people starting to move it around, going to the seats. You will see that they will disappear when they reach their allocated signs. This is just for not cluttering the space. And people are just uh, are, are represented as dots. And every color is basically the, um, the, target, uh, the target floor where they, are, they have their seats assigned. You're not supposed to be hearing any sound. It's just for me. This is just a video uh, for me to be commenting on. And what you see is uh, this is a, a simulation that has been improved. You see a, a lot of behavior that may look a little bit unnatural. In some cases, these uh, are errors. And in some cases, these, these are just uh, in, not a problem in, in general because we have to um, aggregate this in many statistical runs. And then we can just uh, finish. And then we just, OK.
So what we are doing right now, so what is the, the outlook for, for the stadium? We had a huge impact on this project, on this uh, specific testbed because of the COVID pandemic, because uh, by, by, well, the stadium was closed for over a year and we didn't have data and we didn't uh, have a way to try on and test our models. So all of this we have been working on with the synthetic data that we created. And then we are trying now and we're going really fast. Uh, one of the things we're trying now is uh, installing these smart cameras that can process and give, give us a little bit of a more updated idea of the profile of the people entering the stadium. And we are developing also uh, simultaneously the digital twin of the surroundings of the stadium. So we want to uh, make sure that this digital twin and this effort and this testbed is not just applicable to a really large stadium like the Camino Stadium, you know, with 100,000 people, but also to smaller venues and, and venues in different uh, of different types. So we're testing out our ideas on the Johan Cruyff Stadium, which is a 15,000 people uh, stadium, smaller in, 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 and located in the outsides of the city, and also in the area you see here, market in red around the stadium which includes not, not just the basketball and the stadium and the museum, but also uh, all of the commercial and retail area and, and a little bit of the neighborhood. So we know that uh, this is an interesting simulation or digital thing for other applications in the <clears throat> vending industry and, and, and commercial industries. And it's not trivial because it receives about 10 or 15,000 tourists per day that come and buy buy things and go, go to the store, visit the museum and walk around, spend a, a couple of hours there. So it's a rather interesting problem because uh, we also have more data on, on this because the matches happen once a week and this happens every day. So this is the, our normal situation. So this is where we, where we're at not right now. And this is the end of my presentation. And these are partners of the project. And like I said, this uh, digital twin is mostly uh, done on collaboration with the Football Club Barcelona and Barcelona Super Competing Center. So thank you very much. And you can send the questions uh, in, in the booth afterwards.